Good morning and welcome to our service here at Winchester Evangelical Church. I can take this off now, it makes it a lot, lot easier. And it's lo lovely to see you here. Eric and the family are not too well today, so not out. A few verses from 1 Chronicles. It's part of David's prayer when the people had made gifts to the build for the building of the new temple. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honour come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. And that's what we've come to church this morning for, is to worship this great God, this God who has his own kingdom. His is the kingdom, and he is exalted as a head above all. And we're going to start by singing, or we'll stand and um, look at the words and listen to the singing, um, humming, if you like, the first hymn, which is Light of the World, you stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. In the chorus, so here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. And that's what we're here for now. So shall we stand?
Let us now turn to that wonderful God in prayer. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a great and mighty and powerful God. We thank you for your majesty. We thank you for your victory. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your power, Lord. And we know that all the heavens and in the earth and all the earth are yours. We thank you that you created everything and everything belongs to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ, your only son, to this earth to live as a man, to die on the cross for our sin. He died in our place. He had done no wrong. And we thank you, Lord, that he did that for us. We thank you that you raised him the third day. We thank you that he has conquered death, that um, he has co conquered the grave, and that he is in glory today with you. And we thank you that one day we shall be with you, not because we deserve it, but because of your mercy and your love and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are such a great God. We thank you that we can come here to worship and praise your holy name. And we pray, Lord, that you will take away all other thoughts and distractions from us, whether good or bad, as we come before you, as we bow down before you, as we praise your name, whether in song or in prayer, or reading your word or hearing your word spoken. We ask, Lord, that you will guide us and speak to each one of us. We pray that we will know your spirit moving amongst us today and showing us your will and your way. And Lord, we know that we're not alone. We may be small in number here, but we know that there are many, many people around this country and around this world who are coming before you to worship and praise your name. Many in church, but also many more online. And we pray, Lord, that your word will go out with power wherever it is proclaimed. And we pray, Lord, that many will turn to you and come to know you as their Saviour and Lord. Lord, we pray for this country of ours. We pray that you will guide our leaders, Lord. We pray for the Queen and her family. They've got many difficulties. We ask that you will be with them, guide them and help them through these. We pray for the Prime Minister and all those in Parliament. We pray, Lord, that you will guide them. Very difficult decisions have to be made and sometimes it seems to him that whichever way he goes, he will be criticised. We pray, Lord, that you will give him guidance. Give him wisdom and all his advisers, Lord. And we pray that you will bless that. We thank you that there are many in government, in many in Parliament, who know you as their Saviour and Lord. And we pray that you will help them to be able to stand up for you, to speak your word and to share what is right according to your word, Lord, and guide them as they speak in the various debates. And Lord, we pray for this world of ours. It's a fallen world. It's a hard world. It's a bad world. It's a dark world. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless it. We pray, thank you that there are many people, many of your people around the world who worship you, sometimes in secret, sometimes openly. And Lord, there are various parts of the world that we know about, and we ask that you will bless that work. We pray, Lord, for your people in Myanmar. We ask, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will keep them safe. And there's a very dangerous time for them, and we pray that you will bring peace to that land. And we pray, Lord, that your people will be able to speak out and share the gospel. It would be absolutely fantastic to know that the military leaders have turned to you. We pray, Lord, that they will hear your word. We all need to hear your word. However bad we are, however good we are, we need your word and we need your love and we need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord. Bless that country. We pray for the Middle East, Lord, where it looks as though possibly the ceasefire is breaking down. We pray, Lord, that again you will bring peace to that land. And Lord, all three um, religions that are based there, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they all teach peace in their word, the word of their gods, Lord, but your word is the one that counts and you work, want peace. We pray that you will bring peace in that land and we pray that your people will stand up for you. And now, Lord, continue with us here, we pray in your name. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read the first 16 verses. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, and we start with those and then go on. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. 
Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to be looking at those last few verses, salt and light. Our first hymn was Light of the World. And again, we have light in this um, next hymn, which is In Christ Alone, My Hope is Found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And then further down, it says, Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. And we finish with no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Jesus is the light of the world. In the passage, he was telling us that we should be the light of the world as well. And we'll look at that in a moment. So let's stand and listen to the hymn, In Christ Alone.
So we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Salt and light. The Beatitudes have shown us what we as Christians are. Now we move to consider what we as Christians must or should be. The Christian isn't someone who lives in isolation. We live in the world, but are not of this world. We're looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus comes to take us to be with him. But meanwhile, Jesus continues his teaching and he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now this statement has two elements, the negative and the positive. And if we're to be the salt of the earth, it means that the earth needs salt, that it is putrefying, that it is dying, that it's going bad. Therefore, firstly, we need to see what our salt is for, the negative aspect of the phrase. So the negative side. We're in the world. We can't contract out of it. So what do we do? Well, what use is salt? Well, salt gives flavour to food, it preserves food, and it prevents decay. And the fact that Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth implies that the earth, or the world, has lost its flavour. It needs preserving. He's referring to the rottenness in the earth, a tendency to pollution and to becoming foul and offensive. Its tendency is to evil and to wars. It's like meat, which has a tendency to putrefy and to become polluted. Today, of course, we put our meat in the fridge or the freezer to make it last a lot longer, but in Jesus' day, they would have had to have covered it in salt to protect it. Now, we know that the world is in decay, and we don't need scientists to tell us this. We can actually read it in the third chapter of the book of Genesis in the Bible. As soon as Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the forbidden tree, death and decay entered the world. Three chapters later, though several hundred years later, we read in Genesis chapter 6 verse 3, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. So God sent the flood to destroy mankind, to destroy everything, but only Noah was found to be righteous, and he and his family and all the animals were saved in the ark. But after this devastation, there was a new start. A rainbow, beautiful, but it wasn't long before the putrefaction came back. And then, a little further in Genesis, we move to Genesis 19 and the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. And verse 13 in that chapter says, as the angels are talking to um, Abraham, we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. It had come up to, the, to God. The outcry against the people had become so great before the Lord. And this is the story that the Bible is constantly putting before us. This persistent tendency to putrefaction is continuing even today. So what lies ahead of us? Clearly, if we do not start by holding this biblical doctrine of sin at the centre of our thinking, we're not listening to God. The world is bad. It's sinful and it's evil. And any optimism with regard to it is not only thoroughly unscriptural, but has actually been falsified by history itself. And I'm not just talking about global warming or climate change. We know that is happening but I'm talking of the way people are acting and acting towards each other. And not, so we're not looking at global warming. We're not looking at the gas, greenhouse gases and everything else that we're doing to damage the world like that. It's actually the sin in the world which is causing more damage to the world. We as humans are destroying it. It's our lack of a relationship with God who created the world and all that is in it that is causing the problem. And the world can only be kept wholesome by means of a preservative or an antiseptic. The world left to itself is something that tends to fester. There are these germs of evil, microbes, 
infective agents and organisms in the very body of humanity. And unless checked, they cause disease. We've thought of the negative state of the world, how bad it is because of the lack of relationship with the Creator. But let's have a look at the positive. There is always in the Bible a positive when there's a negative. And the way out of the putrefaction of the world is the salt. What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? So changing over to look positively, Jesus is saying that the Christian in the world should be salt. The word here he says, you are the salt of the earth, but it's actually, if we translate it properly, the emphasis in the original Greek says, you and you alone. That's the emphasis. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. We are to be unlike the world. We are to be different to the world, just as salt is different to the food or meat in which it's placed. It exercises all its qualities by being different. It adds flavour or it preserves. Verse 13 of Matthew 5 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So we know that when we add just a small amount of salt to our food, it makes all the difference. We don't have to add the whole salt pot. Most recipes tell you it's a pinch of salt. Now, my pinch tends to be a bit smaller than some of these chefs you see on television who seem to have a handful as they put it in, but it's still not a huge amount compared to what they're cooking. And it wasn't long ago I was cooking a meal for Sarah and me and I misread the recipe. And I added a tablespoon of salt instead of a teaspoon of salt. We needed a lot of water to calm the taste in our mouths. You don't need a terrific amount of salt. Just a little amount of salt will, is what's needed. And it's different to the food around it and the Christian has to be different from everybody else. And not only to be different, but it's to give glory in this difference, to glory God. We should be different to those around as Jesus was to the people around him. The Christian is a separate, unique, outstanding kind of individual. There should be something in us to mark us out, which should be obvious and clearly recognised. That doesn't mean that we have to wear a huge cross, just as the Archbishop of Canterbury does. It doesn't mean that we have to always be carrying a big black Bible with us. But we do need to be seen. People need to know that we are salt. Salt disappears in the food. When it's put into the food, it disappears. You don't see it. Well, unless you put a lot on your chips, like I do, sometimes do. But you don't generally see it. It's mixed in with it and it gives a flavour to that food. Jesus is talking here of the individual Christian. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about each one of us individually. Now, there are those who believe the church should stand up and speak against war and poverty and make political pronouncements in it. In fact, many churches do this. But Jesus is speaking to you and me as individuals. Salt in its container is useless. It has to be rubbed into the meat to preserve it or added to food to increase the flavour. And this implies that the world is going off and is without flavour. So we as Christians in church today, we're not actually helping anyone out there. We are here to worship God because we are told we should be. We are here to worship together and to hear the word of God and to praise his name. But it's when we leave this building that we each are an individual out there being sought. If we look around us, we see people desperate to go abroad on holiday. There are those who are anxious to get back to the pub. There's a cry to open nightclubs and the world is looking for pleasure. It's hedonistic. It needs all these things. I haven't been able to go to the pub for months and months. You know, I, I desperately need to go to a nightclub and be with all those people in a loud, noisy situation. Uh, that's their feeling. And I must go and find um, the sun. I must go on holiday abroad. Um, what was it on Monday? The newspapers were all saying that actually it was hotter here than it was in uh, Faro in Portugal, where a lot of people had gone. So it's 
that sort of thing. The world is looking for this pleasure. And many cry out to remove all the restrictions we currently have, not because they believe the virus has gone, but because they need these pleasures for their life. They've got nothing in their life without these pleasures. These has been taken away from them. The Christian doesn't need these entertainments. They may enjoy them, but we don't need them because we have a savour in life, a, a savour in life, our Christian faith take Christianity out of the world and what an insipid thing life becomes, especially when one gets old or is on one's deathbed. It is utterly tasteless and people have to drug themselves in various ways because they feel their need of a saviour, savour. They need that something in their life and that's what they're looking for. But Christians have a savour in the form of a saviour, that extra letter, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the early church, the Christians stood up against the ways of the Roman world, not because they were anti-Rome, but Rome wasn't interested in the poor. And the Christians were interested in the poor. The number of times we read, particularly in Acts, of how the people looked after the poor um, and gave them money, and money was being circulated from other churches all around where Paul had been to go back to Jerusalem for the poor. Yes, the poor Christians, but they were thinking of the poor as well. And that's what um, it is. They were being salt in that time. Now, it's been suggested that when France had its revolution with Madame la Guillotine, um, Britain didn't, didn't have one because there were many evangelical Christians who were being salt, who were looking after the poor, who were fighting against slavery, who were bringing about changes with the Factory Acts, bringing about education for children, schools, they were being different, being sought. And as Christians, we are citizens of a country. And it is our business to play our part as citizens and thereby act as sought indirectly in innumerable respects. But that is a very different thing from the church doing it. It's individuals, and that's how Jesus is speaking. Over the past century, the church has made pronouncements. Resolutions have been sent from church assemblies and general assemblies of the various denominations to the governments. We've all been so tremendously interested in the practical application. But what's the result? The result is that we are living in a society which is probably more immoral today than it was 50 years ago, in which vice, law-breaking and lawlessness seem to be rampant. Many Christians have lost their saltiness. When you enter a room of colleagues or friends or in amongst your neighbours or even going to a coffee morning when we're allowed to, that sort of thing, are those people, others there, immediately controlled in their language and in their general conversation because you've arrived? They may know you're a Christian, but do they make a difference? Does it make a difference when you enter the room because they know you're a Christian and don't swear? and don't tell those dirty jokes and all that sort of thing. One truly saintly man radiates his influence. It will permeate any group in which he happens to be. And unfortunately, the salt has lost its saltiness in so many instances, and it isn't there, perhaps because we're hiding it. No one knows that we're Christian. And what do you do at the weekend? Oh, well, we, I go and do this, that and the other. And you don't point out that that's on Saturday, but on Sunday you go to church. You keep that quiet. We need to be that salt. We need to be the salt of the earth. We need to make a difference just by being in the world. If we've been saved and transformed by the Holy Spirit, it does affect others around us, even without us opening our mouths. Are you salt? Or have you lost your saltiness? A Christian without being salt is a waste of time, suitable to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Jesus said to the people at the time and to us now, you are the salt of the earth. But he also went on to say, you are the light of the world. Salt and light, they don't seem to go together. But in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was speaking to ordinary people. Many would have been illiterate, 
Many would have been simple people and not highly educated, yet Jesus tells all these people that they are to be the light of the world. Just as we looked at being the salt of the earth in negative and positive ways, we can do the same with this statement. To be light, to shine out. So, um, those that fought against slavery, um, William Wilberforce, for instance, you know, he was, yes, he was salt quietly, but also he was speaking out. He was light to the world. Jesus said, you and you alone, the same phrase, are the light of the world. There are certain things implied by this statement. Now, the first is that the world must be in a state of darkness. If we're to be light, we're to shine in the darkness. There's no point in me having a torch in here. We don't need it. We've got light in here. But in the darkness of the world, we do need to be light. We do need a torch. If there's judgment for sin in this world. And Jesus doesn't say that there are other lights, so be like them, or be brighter than them. He simply states that we are to be light because there is no other revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the only way to salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus said. And that is the only way. He's the only way, and we are the light, and we reflect his light into his world. We're not told to try to be light. Jesus implies that the true believer is light. This is how we are if we are a member of his kingdom. Now, the world is truly in darkness. It thinks it's enlightened. The world concentrates solely on knowledge, the knowledge of things, mechanical things, scientific things, a knowledge of life in a more or less purely biological or mechanical sense. In fact, they're even putting aside the biological knowledge that they thought they had to believe that there are now, for instance, more than two genders. Despite all this knowledge, we fail to discover the most important thing of all, namely, what to do with our knowledge from God, the knowledge we have from God. There are great men and women of knowledge, but often there is a tragic breakdown in personal relationships. We've multiplied institutions and organisations. We have to give instruction now concerning things about which people were never instructed in the past. No one in the Bible went to um, marriage guidance counselling or to um, pre-marriage courses. There are all these courses that we're going on, we have to undergo. We have to undergo training in racism. We have to go undergo training in sexism, in transphobia. We have to learn how to not do or say anything that someone might find upsetting. And I gather that even micro um, movements such as raising an eyebrow or turning away from someone, that's offensive and um, could be reported to the police. We even have to learn how we feel, those of us, about our white privilege and deal with it, whatever that actually means. But once upon a time, racism was, call was calling a person of colour a rude name. And today that still happens, yes, and it shouldn't, and that's wrong. But today we mustn't even ask whether the child of a mixed-race couple will be lighter or darker than the parents. That seemed to be it. Well, you know, where even, um, you know, we talk about people who, who have, um, I've got one of my sisters has blue eyes, her husband has brown eyes, and all the talk was, I wonder what colour eyes the child would have. That wasn't because one is better than the other. It was just, I wonder. Is it before the scans and things, is it going to be a boy or a girl? I'm just wondering, I don't mind, but I just wonder. Now beyond personal relationships, we should look at relationships between group and group, and then relationships between nation and nation. And over the past century or so, we talked so much about our knowledge and enlightenment and looking at great industrial and economic problems, but it's proving to us that the world is in a state of unutterable darkness with regard to these vital and fundamental problems. We don't have the answers. Jesus looked at this band of ordinary, insignificant people and said, you and you alone are the light of the world. History itself is now proving more and more the truth of the gospel. The darkness of the world has never been more evident than it is now. So that's the negative implication of the text. So let's consider the positive. Jesus says, you. In other words, its claim is that the ordinary Christian, 
though he may never have read philosophy at all, who may never have gone on courses, theological courses, should know and understand more about life than the greatest expert who is not a Christian. This is one of the major themes of the New Testament. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The thing that appears to be utterly ridiculous to the world is the pure wisdom of God. The inference is that we are called to do something positive. Then this is the second statement which Jesus makes with regard to the function of the Christian in this world. And having described the Christian in general in the Beatitudes, the first thing he then says is you are the salt of the earth. Now he says you are the light of the world. It's a statement concerning the ordinary average Christian, not certain Christians only. It is applicable to all who rightly claim his name. And none of these is talking to just those who stand up and preach or those that are missionaries, or those who um, are really in the, the art, public eye, if you like, for doing those sort of things. It is for each one of us. The question is, how? Remember Jesus said, you are the light of the world, but he also said, I am the light of the world. And these two statements should be taken together. The Christian is only the light of the world because of his relationship to Jesus, who is himself the, the light of the world. And Jesus claimed that he had come to bring light. He also said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the whole world is divided into children of light and children of darkness. And so much of the world is life under a kind of shroud of darkness. The worst things always happen under cover of darkness. Light exposes what is being done under cover of darkness. John 3, 19 says, and this is the judgment. Jesus said, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So in spite of all the knowledge that's been amassed since the beginning of the Enlightenment, halfway through the 18th century, fallen man still loves darkness rather than light. We aren't enlightened. We're still in darkness. The result is that though we, he knows what is right, he prefers and does what is evil. He has a conscience which warns him before he does anything he knows to be wrong, but nevertheless he does it. He may regret it, but he still does it. And the trouble with man is not in his intellect, it is in his nature the passions and the lusts. And though you try to educate and control people, it will come to nothing, as long as his nature is sinful and fallen. He is a cre creature of passion and dishonour. That is the condemnation. There is no one to warn the modern world except the Christian. The gospel offends in that it makes a man face himself, and it always tells him that same thing. The fault is not in our stars, it's in ourselves. Men love darkness rather than light. That's the trouble, and the gospel alone proclaims it. God doesn't stop at that. Light not only exposes the darkness, it shows and provides the way out of the darkness. And this is where every Christian should be jumping to the task. Man has tried knowledge. We've tried education, political enactments, international conferences. We've tried them all, but nothing helps. Is there no hope? Yes, there is hope. And Jesus said it. You must be born again. So what man needs is not more light. He needs a nature that will love the light and hate the darkness. The exact opposite of his loving the darkness and hating the light. Man needs to get back to God. The Christian is here to tell him, that there is a way to God, a very simple one. It is to know one person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the Son of God, and he came from heaven to earth to seek and save that which was lost. He came to illumine the darkness, to expose the cause of the darkness, and to make a new and living way out of it all, back to God and into heaven. We're living in the midst of men and women who are in a state of gross darkness. They will never have any light anywhere in this world except from you and me and the gospel we believe and teach. They're watching us. 
Do they see something different about us? Are our lives a silent rebuke to them? Do we live so as to lead them to come and ask us, why do you always look so peaceful? How is it you are so balanced? How can you stand up to things as you do? Why is, is it that you are not dependent on artificial aids and pleasures as we are? What is this thing that you have got? If they come and ask, we can tell them the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But do they know that they can ask that question of us? Do they know that we are a Christian? Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you, we overdo it, like um, putting in too much salt into the meal. You don't go into your um, office and um, start shouting, preaching the gospel to everyone out loud. You don't walk down the street preaching and telling everyone. You don't uh, knock on every door in your street and tell them that they are sinners um, and overdo it. If you're doing it all the time, they're going to get fed up and want, not want you. But are, is it the way you live your life that is seen by other people? Christian people alone are the light of the world today. So let us live and function as children of the light. If you are ashamed of Jesus and his kingdom, you've misunderstood the Beatitudes. You can't be salt and light. Christians who are ashamed of being Christians are as useless as flavourless salt or light that is under a basket. Christian, you are the salt, you are the light, and the world shall see you and rejoice and glorify God before you. And that's the thing. And the last words of that was, it, um, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Not, oh, well done, that's brilliant, you're doing that. It's actually to see beyond you that you're only doing this because it is God's will, and they glorify God. The, the world should see us and rejoice and glorify God. The darker the world, the brighter the light should shine. Now, before we come to the table this morning, where we remind ourselves that Jesus died on the cross for us, his body was broken, his blood was shed for us. We're going to stand and um, listen to another hymn. It's, this one is, "'Tis finished." The, word, the last word that Jesus cried, tetelestai, it is finished. Not, oh, at last. It's, I've done it. It's happened. "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice. The great redeeming work is done." And we read further on, that God for a guilty world has died. And then the veil is rent in Christ alone. The living way to heaven is seen. The middle wall is broken down and all mankind may enter in. The high priest once a year would go behind the curtain of the temple um, to offer a sacrifice. But when Jesus died, that curtain was torn in two and meant that anyone could go in, not just the high priest. We can all go in to God. So let's stand and listen to the words of this hymn, "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies."
those great words from Charles Wesley. The tune may have made it sound as though it was a, a rather modern one, but he actually wrote it many years ago. But it's a great thing. The reign of sin and death is over. And all may live from sin set free. Satan has lost his mortal power to swallowed up in victory. And I like the reminder of the legal side of things because God is the great judge and we will all have to stand before him one day. And in sec the second verse, it says that exacted is the legal pain. It's, the pain's been exacted, it's been taken. And then in the third verse, saved from the legal curse I am. Jesus took that pain, that legal pain, that pain that had to be borne in order to save us, our punishment. We can't get, it can't be done without punishment. And Jesus took that. And therefore, we've been saved from that legal curse. He expired. He died for me. And we can claim heaven as our victory. Now, before we have the bread and the drink, I'd just like you to think of the words from Isaiah 53. And I'm going to show them on the screen, but also um, there's, they're going to be sung. They are words straight from the authorised version of the Bible of um, verses 3 to 6 of Isaiah 53. So just look at them, think of them, meditate on those words of what Jesus did for us. reminding us of what the Lord Jesus did for us and how he was despised, rejected, grievous. And we hid our faces from him, or people did at the time, even his disciples ran away when he was arrested. A few verses from 1 Corinthians 11, which talks, where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll eat the bread as we receive it. We thank you, Lord, that we can share this bread, the broken bread, in memory of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He was beaten, he was whipped, he had the crown of thorns on his head, the nails through his hands and his feet. He bore all that pain for us. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll save the wine and drink together when we've all been served. Let us drink together with thankfulness. we thank you that we can drink of this cup again in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood that was shed for our sins. Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins and we thank you that through his shedding of his blood our sins have been forgiven and he has paid the price for us. We thank you Lord that it is finished. He did what was needed. We don't need any priests anymore. We don't need anyone to, any sacrifices, because he was the perfect sacrifice, the innocent who died for the guilty. And we thank you that through his blood, through your grace, mercy and love, that we can one day be with you in glory, worshipping you, bowing down to you and praising your name because you are our God. You're altogether lovely, altogether wonderful to me. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And now let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. <laughs> 